Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back, lecture five. Today we'll be talking about rates and durations. And speaking of rates and durations, uh, your final projects are almost here. Uh, so the next lecture would be the last lecture of the course. And then we'll have uh, meetings, uh, four to five meetings of presentations that you'll be giving. Uh, so in the exercise this week and on the course website, you have uh, guidelines of how that would work out. Uh, you need to pre prepare five minutes of a calculation related to some question of interest that you'll be doing in front of class. Uh, I know already from last time that it's quite an experience and a learning experience for people in terms of uh, standing in front of class, focusing your thoughts, doing things on the whiteboard. I know it's challenging, but I think you'll find that uh, it's something that you really gain uh, from the experience. Uh, another uh, insight from last year uh, is uh, that it's really important. Those who prepared for it carefully really did much better in their interaction with class. And therefore, for this year, we ask you, uh, as you'll see in the, in the guidelines, that you'll be preparing before and working with the pair, somebody that would serve as sort of like a mentor on your presentation, that you'll be giving that uh, before to that person. And uh, through that, both they and you will have a better presentation. <coughs> okay? Okay, so the first meeting, uh, you can already see the date there. The date of your personal lecture is already in the course website. If you have any problems and you want to switch, you can switch with somebody else. That's fine with us. Just let us know. Uh, and even though you sit actually next year, so it seems like you don't need to worry about it. It's only 2015. Uh, it's in two weeks. So speaking of rates and durations. Any questions on that? OK, so we can jump in directly uh, to the following. What is faster? Let's start with bacteria. Transcription. Or translation. So we're looking at the two pillars of the central dogma happening in the cells of our body or in bacteria. And let's do a quick vote. Would it be transcription? B would be translation. What's the C would be about the same. And the question is, what is the measure? Okay, so let's say for the same amount of information. Okay, okay so let's say if you're talking about three nucleotides here would give you one amino acid here, for that, that would be our quanta. Or if you want to think about the whole length of the protein. Okay, so who's, who's thinking about, who's voting for transcription? A few. Who's voting for translation? Most. Who's voting for both? Oh, excuse me, not both. Uh, about the same. A few. Okay, so let's see how, how we can approach that. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a scenario of, how should I, would be the nicest way to do it. I have the DNA. No, excuse me. Let's think about the mRNA that on the one hand comes from, I have here the double helix, blah, blah, blah. On it, I'll have one machine that would go in this direction. This would be what? What would be this machine? This would be the RNA polymerase. And then I'll have another machine here, which would be what? The ribosome, right. I have this machine running in one direction. I have this machine churning it in a different direction. Let's say it's sitting. So we're making this. It would go in this direction and would give us the protein coming out here. OK, and we're interested in the velocity of this machine versus the velocity that we'll be getting from this machine in the relevant units. OK, so far so good. So 
So, velocity of the polymerase. Does anyone remember any number about the scale of that? So you might remember, so what, what you see here, we actually, in this case, it's very hard to get these numbers out of thin air. Actually, if somebody has a strategy to infer that, I'll be very interested in that. But it's the kind of numbers that appear in those key numbers, like the few key numbers that I would suggest that you have, you know, in front of you, next to your screen in your, in your office or something, which are very useful in making all sorts of inferences. We'll see some examples uh, this week, and you can find other examples, I'm sure, as well. So the rate of the polymerase is roughly 40 to 80 nucleotides per second. That's the uh, characteristic rate of transcription in bacteria. The other relevant and useful number is the same issue for the ribosome. Anyone remember something about the rate of the ribosome? Something like 15 or 20 amino acids per second in a bacteria working you know, in exponential phase, etc. But now, this is exactly the question that was asked before. What am I talking about in terms of my units of rate? So it makes sense to, if this is 20 amino acids per second, if I want to put it on the same scale, or if I have a, a sequence I want to transcribe and then translate, I probably want to think per, say, per base. So I can multiply it by number of nucleotides per amino acid, which would be what? Three. Three. So I'm getting something which is very similar to this rate. So effectively, this is like 60 nucleotides per second. So we find that these two rates are about the same. Now again, I just want to stress out, it seems that you know, I'm taking those numbers out of thin air, I'm just you know, citing them to you. So one thing you can just you know, find it in the literature or find it in some database or something. But it's also, I would say, remember it's somewhere between 10 and 100 per second is quite useful in doing all sorts of other inferences in biology. And I still wonder myself, I'm very curious about why is it not say 10 times faster or 100 times faster, there'll be great implications about the ability of cells to grow and some of them you'll be touching in the, uh, in the exercise that you have this week that relates to the rate of the ribosome. So if anyone has insights on that, that would be very interesting. Very nice. So you're saying, so, so what uh, uh, he said is, okay, if we think not in the rate, which is the functional rate, I did something which is functional, about if you want to make a gene, you have to run this machine and that machine. You're saying, if we're looking at the physical, ra physical velocity, by how much roughly would this be faster than this? So we have the factor of three that we put in, and there's also the size of this versus that, and we know that nucleotide is bigger than amino acid, so this would be something, I don't know, one has to do the exact calculation, probably like five times faster or something like that. Velocity? That's the velocity at which the machine, if you like, if you were looking in, you know, in an animation, it would be moving along the strand. Like in units of, say, meter per second, or probably we'd like it in nanometer per so second. It runs, on, it runs on the mRNA. Ah, yes, you're right. There's no factor of three. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll just serve as a... Okay, so I, I, I agree with you that if we look at the, at the rate which is moving along the transcript, I don't need to think about the factor of three. This works in nucleotides and this reads nucleotides. But if you want to talk about the velocity at which, say, the protein is being formed, then there's this factor as well. Okay, very good. And it's interesting to try and, com and, and try and maybe to find how does that relate to actual velocity, 
and what is it in comparison to other velocities inside the cell, etc. How, how would that how would that be? Yeah. Excellent. So if uh, the formula was faster, then it would end, end before uh, the Wonderful. So if, if I'll, I'll reiterate your point, what you're saying is we found that they're about the same, and only a few people guessed that, but now you're saying, actually, I have a good way to guess it beforehand, at least in terms of the fact that it would be very tough for translation to be faster than transcription in bacteria. Why? Because they're happening concurrently, right? When transcription is happening, at the same time, you have translation happening. Meaning that if translation was faster than transcription, then it would need to override to be faster than the polymerase. It have, would have no substrate of mRNA to work on. And therefore, we know that it would be very, very, this is impossible for the case of bacteria. Um, if I wanted to move from this into mammalian cells or into uh, eukaryotic ce cells in general, what would be different? The location. The location. Splicing. Okay, so there'll be all sorts of things being changing, but splicing is a huge thing here, right? Because these rates probably would change. They tend to change, you know, say in a, in a mammalian, say in a human mammalian cell, they'll be several times slower. Both the rate of transcription and the rate of translation. But the huge effect is the fact that this would, have, uh, this would have to also make the introns that would not have to go through the ribosome. But are the translation units per length and not per like? So if you take the same length, you take some of the introns and some of the uh, axons, but it would be the same ultimate length if you... Right, so, so for the same length, it's the same thing, but if I'm thinking about a whole gene that I want to do, that would be a big effect. And actually, it could be on the order, usually on the average, about 30 times longer, the introns than the exons. So that gives a huge effect in terms of how long would it take me to do one versus the other. So this brings us to a related question that I think is of interest, and that is, how long would it take to make a functional protein? So I'm thinking here, let's say I already have the mRNA and I want to make the protein. How long would it take from the time that, let's say, I have some induction, meaning up till now I didn't need that protein, now I need to start making it? What would be the time that it would take? So what roughly would, uh, would, what would get, what has to play in in order to calculate that? I have to know the length of my mRNA. So what would be a characteristic length of the mRNA? For a gene, so I want to make a protein, right? What's the length of a protein on the average? 300 amino acids, say. So what's the length of the mRNA? About 1 kb, right? In bacteria. So I have about 1,000 bases. The velocity is, say... 30 bases per second. So the time would be on the order of, say, 30 seconds. 1,000 divided by 30, or roughly, you know, like, a minute. But you have many genes, so it doesn't have Okay, so if I have, if I have a polycystronic and then it depends how many genes I have. For the first gene, it would be roughly that. For the other ones, it depends where would I have my, if I have a ribosome binding site, I would connect there and I would still make it at roughly, that would be my delay. But then if I have the issue of introns, then it could be way longer depending on the fact of how many introns I have and how much slower I am in the specific organism. Any comments about that? 
Now, this is talking about the time, so this is quite fast, right? But, so what is this? This is talking about the time in which I'll get the first few proteins being expressed. But then you can ask, how long would it take to get a functional amount? Maybe one protein inside the cell or two proteins inside the cell might not make a big difference or would not be functional. So for that, we have to think overall in the cell, uh, what is the relevant concentration that I'll be getting? So in order to analyze that, I'd like you to look at the following. So I'm interested in looking at, say, the concentration of proteins as a function of time. By the way, here we were talking only about the process of, I was doing the calculation. That's fine, I was doing the, the, I was doing the calculation assuming concurrent transcription translation. If it's not concurrent, I have to sum the processes together. But now, let's think about what, how would that, uh, if I'm trying to do a scheme of what happens to the concentration of a protein I'm interested in inside the cell, and let's assume that in the beginning it's, uh, it's shut off, it's not needed, and at some point I'm putting some inducer that would activate that gene. For example, I don't know, IPTG or whatever inducer you ever met in the lab or did not meet in the lab that uh, induces uh, the activation of, of some gene. And then I'm interested in how uh, would the shape of that look and what would be the characteristic time scales. So what would be the shape of, of, uh, of the graph here? So at the end, I would have some steady state concentration, right? So this would be my steady state level. And then I'm starting from some off level. That would be my basal level that I'm starting with. And then at some point, I'm putting the inducer. Let's say it's here. And then what did we calculate right now? What was this number? This was some sort of a delay time, right? From the time that I started, I put the inducer until I'll start to get some copies. So I have some time of, some delay time, which is the response for the first few genes. So I have a basal level plus the delay time. And then what, how would the shape look like? I've heard before. So we have something that now you're starting to see expression and would saturate to the steady state. I'm assuming no overshoot, that's right. Okay. Which is, I think, very reasonable in most cases. I guess it would be exponential in the beginning because you have more mRNAs being created, not just one mRNA. So in the beginning, you have MR one mRNA and one protein, then you create another mRNA and two uh, proteins at the same time. OK, so, so th there, there could be all sorts of dynamics on how exactly does it look here, whether it starts in a linear form or quadratic form, exponential form. OK, I'm less worried about that for a second. I would just want to see the characteristic relevant time scales here. So I have the delay time. And then I have some time which refers to the, uh, so you know, reaching the steady state, that's hard to measure because you know, how, how much do you actually reach that every time you have some, some dynamics of, uh, of a decay to saturation, it could take a long time. But I could define, say, the time that it would take to reach half of the maximum. Let's say one half of the concentration at steady state. And this time, yes, yeah, so I could define it half of the difference between the basal level and the steady state level. So, and this time, this would be so like my, this tau would be the effective response time. often denoted tau one half, meaning the time until it reaches half of the functional level for the response. And so this could be very different than the time that we calculated here because it's not about when do I have one copy of 
functional protein that has been expressed, or five copies, that's about when I'm reaching about, about the amount, let's say half of the amount, of the functional protein that are supposed to be expressed as part of the response of the cell. And therefore, it's the response time of the cell. So there's a, there's a lot of, so one could analyze it in, in quite a lot of details. And I'd like in the spirit of this course to just give you some relevant uh, numbers that would be useful for you to think about this process inside cells. And it's not immediately uh, evident, but for that you have to go through the differential equations, etc. When you're thinking about this response time, what would you think would govern that response time? You could think about all sorts of things. Maybe it's the level, you know, how strong is the promoter, right? It turns out that this, is, this response time depends on either the degradation rate of the gene or the cell cycle. So it's these two factors that usually govern this number, and the response and the, and the promoter strength is only governing what would be the steady state level. So if I have a stronger promoter, I'll have a higher steady state level, but the response time usually would change very little. So anyone who wants to know more details on that uh, could do a few options. He could go to the great uh, courses that we have here at Weizmann on uh, introduction to Systems Biology, so there's a course given by Naama Barkai, there's a course given by Uri Alon, and both of them get into the mathematics of that and the insights around that. Or alternatively, you can read the, the book by Uri Alon, Introduction to Systems Biology, that also gets into, the, uh, into this process in much more detail. Introduction. So I'd like us to spend a minute looking at these things that would govern the response time. So you can start running it in your head. What would you expect for these numbers to be? So let's go through several organisms that would be characteristic of the ones that, uh, that would be useful for us. And we'll start by mRNA. And let's look in bacteria, in some eukaryotic organisms, so unicellular, uni so I would take the budding yeast, and let's take a human cell, human cell line. That would be HeLa. And then in order to know the response time, I have to know something about these two mechanisms. So let's analyze their time scales. We'll look at the degradation rate. And we'll look at the cell cycle time. So let's start with a bacteria. What should I put for cell cycle time? What? An About an hour. Yeah, that would be a good characteristic time for the cell cycle. For yeast? A few hours, say three hours. For a human cell line? About a day. Okay, degradation time. Somebody knows the degradation, the characteristic degradation rate of a, of a message of mRNA in bacteria? So that's roughly, this is usually a few minutes, say three minutes. In yeast, that would be about 30 minutes. In a human cell line, that would be about 300 minutes. This is of course, an average, if you look at the distribution of these things in some characteristic fast exponential growth, 
these are the numbers that you find for the median or the average. And of course, there's some variation. So you can find ones that are much faster, ones that are significantly slower. But if you look at the characteristic uh, transcript, you can see that this is several times slower than the cell cycle time. What does that dictate about our question about the response time? It means that if you look at these two, uh, two processes, the ones that would govern the response time is the faster of the two. Okay, because these processes, you're starting to express something, the time until it reaches the steady state, if the cell cycle is very, very long, what really matters is it's being expressed and degraded. There'll be the time until it reaches the steady state where these two things balance out. And then you'll be dependent on the degradation rate, and this is what happens for mRNAs. So for mRNAs, in order to know that the response time until you'll be getting uh, half of your maximal uh, mRNA, it would come from these, these would be the relevant time scales, and they would be governed by this. And now we can do the similar analysis for the proteins. So again, we'll be looking at bacteria, yeast, and HeLa. We'll be looking at the degradation rate and the cell cycle. So who can help me with the cell cycle? So bacteria, same idea, right? So this would be one hour, three hours, one day. Anyone about the degradation rate of proteins? So come, some characteristic numbers, so this is usually in the few hours. This would be roughly one day, and this would be several days. This, by the way, you remember we inferred last class from energetic reasons, from just calculating how much ATP is available for a characteristic human cell line, how many proteins it have, and from that we could tell from the investment that it would be very tough to do it much faster than that on the average. Which does not say that you know, for some specific uh, proteins it might be significantly faster. But on the average, that's... Uh, so what do you see in the contrast between this and that? If we're saying that the, the faster time scale is the one that governs the response time, then it means that the response for looking at the level of the protein, the response at the protein level, would be governed now by these, so one hour, three hours, and one day, they're smaller than these values, so this is bigger than this, whereas here the situation was this way, and therefore the cell cycle time for the fast exponential growing cells of this type would be the one governing the response time that we'll be measuring you from the time that we're putting some induction until we'll be seeing the steady state uh, approaching, the levels approaching the steady state. So I know this is somewhat abstract, but those who want to get more details on exactly how do I know that this is the, these are the two processes that govern it could uh, follow either the book or some of the other courses. One interesting question I got last year was the following. So if I have this length of time for the response, what does it mean, for example, when I want to give an antibiotic? Let's say I'm putting some antibiotic against cells, and then we have an antibiotic resistance cell, an uh, antibiotic resistance gene inside the cell. But how, what are the relevant time scale? There's the time scale until it would diffuse into the cell and create some havoc by, say, interacting with the ribosome or something like that. This is one time scale, and then there's this time scale of the gene responding to that, of expressing the gene that would enable the resistance. What would be the time scale for the resistant protein to be expressed? Let's say in an E. coli. So if it needs to be induced, we know it would be roughly the cell cycle, so say one hour. What would be the time scale for it to affect the cell? 
Well, it depends on you know, how fast does diffusion happen, etc. We'll talk about it very soon, but one could expect that it would be way faster, less than a minute. So it's an interesting, situa interesting biological situation here. How is it that when you're putting an antibiotic, and there is antibiotic resistance, how does the resistance actually effectively defend from it? Because if it needs to be expressed, it would take it an hour. Okay, so this could be one explanation saying, uh, what Oshri is saying, if my basal level, if I have it expressed even before I put the antibiotic to some level, at least to a level that would defend me from the antibiotic, then I'll be able to, uh, to sustain the, the existence of the bacteria and maybe then do some further actions. So this could be one explanation. If somebody wants to dig more deeply into it, I think it's an interesting biological question to see what is actually happening here, whether this is the explanation or something else. Yeah, there's a comment there. Uh, there are also several mechanisms for antibiotics. So if you are working with ampicillin, you have instant resistance versus kinamycin, where you need at least one cell cycle. OK, right. So, so it also depends on what specific antibiotics you're interested in. OK, so in order to be able to connect these two things, and in general to know something about the relevant types of effects, I want to challenge you with the following. How long does it take to diffuse across a cell. So you can think, for example, about the antibiotic that got into the cell, say around the, you know, from the membrane area, until it reaches, you know, say, the other side of the cell, or if it's some, uh, some transcription factor that was next to the membrane, got some message from some receptor. So I have the cell. So it's either something that comes in, how long would it take it to diffuse to the other side? Or alternatively, let's say I have some ligand binding to some receptor. This is causes some activation of a protein here. And this protein has to go into the nucleus. How long roughly would it take uh, to do that process by diffusion? So I'm thinking either of bacteria or a mammalian cell. And the question is, is it about 10 microseconds for bacteria? 10 milliseconds? Um, OK, this was supposed to be something else. Just one second. 10 seconds. Or in the, or in the mammalian cell, is it about 100? microseconds, 100 milliseconds, excuse me, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, one second, 10 seconds, one minute, or 10 minutes. And similarly here, there was supposed to be a few more options to make life interesting. A hundred microseconds, ten milliseconds, a hundred milliseconds, one second, or ten seconds. And so I'm only interested in the time scale for a bacteria and for a mammalian cell. And the challenge for you for the recess is to try and find a way to estimate this thing in the two different cells. Or to yeah, to estimate it in one way or another. Any question about the question? Yes. I'm just wondering the basic of what is the field that drives it to the cell? I mean, what is the force that actually doesn't wander around itself, but actually goes from one point to the other? Excellent. So let me try and repeat that question to see that I got it right. You're saying, 
What is the force that makes sure that if I have the antibiotic coming in, that would drive it to move to the other side? Or if I have some receptor in the ligand that activated some transcription factor here, what forces it to go into the nucleus? Okay, the question is clear. So the answer is there is no force that needs to drive that. It happens by diffusion. That's why we're talking about diffusion. It's the marvel of, 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 of things which are small. That by diffusion, just by the random movement, they're getting bumped by water molecules and by other things. They'll be doing some random walk. And through that random walk, they'll be getting, you know, they'll be achieving all of the things they need to do in our cells of moving from one place to the other, activating, repressing, doing all that. So it's quite, uh, it's quite amazing. OK, so another good question. You're saying, would it not depend on the concentration? So I guess for, you know, it might make sense that if I have you know, a very high concentration here and a very low concentration here, there'll be a strong gradient moving to this direction. Whereas if I have the same concentration in both points, there is no gradient pushing it, right? This is your, the line of thought. OK, the answer to that is actually, this is even more non-intuitive. It's the same answer as before. Concentration is, you know, you might have seen it before in, so, in some courses. And when you want to solve uh, an analysis of how the, the concentration would change with time, and that depends on the gradient. But every molecule here lives by itself. It gets bumped by some other molecule. It doesn't know about anything about concentration. If I'm an antibiotic that came inside the cell, I do not know whether there's a lot of them here and none of them here, or actually there's a whole lot, you know, homogeneously dispersed inside the cell. Each one gets bumped, each one diffuses randomly, does this random walk, and this would govern how long it would reach from one place to the other. The, the concentration gradient would govern how the temporal concentration would change with time, but that's a different question. We're now taking the perspective, not of the overall concentrations, but we're just saying, you know, I'm just a naive molecule, I found myself inside the cell, how long would it take me to reach the other cell? by the process of diffusion that's governing what happens inside but cells. But the cell concentration does affect the diffusion. So we'll be... We'll matter, but it has effect. It's the cell. Okay, so... so in dense, in dense medium, you, you okay, so what Moshe is saying, if we're talking about the process of diffusion, if I have a very, very high concentration inside the cell, usually there's a very high concentration of different things, this could affect the rate of diffusion. This is true, but really a side point in this case, because we're talking here about the concentration of, say, the antibiotic that came in or the transcription factor that needs to get to the nucleus. Their concentration would not affect the single molecule effect. What is the macromolecular properties of that media in which one needs to diffuse? That's true. That could affect the diffusion coefficient, and we'll be talking about that after the recess. So for the recess, you need to refresh yourself as well as try to infer either yourself or in pairs the relevant time scale in bacteria and the mammalian cell. Thanks. <coughs>
force driving it from one direction to the other, just by this random walk it would happen. Similarly, it would not depend on the concentration of this specific <coughs> protein, because it doesn't know about the concentration of its friends, other molecules. It only knows about the properties of the media itself. For example, the overall concentration of the media. So all of those properties of this process would be engulfed in one uh, constant called D, the diffusion constant or diffusion coefficient. And with knowledge of only this, there's a direct relationship that says that R goes as the square root of 6 times d times tau. Okay, So if you diffuse for some given amount of time, the distance that you would reach would depend only on this time and only on the property of the diffusion coefficient. And it would go as the square root, meaning that it's not linear with the time, but there's a square root factor here. And we'll see that that plays out in, in an interesting way. So the, and anyone who wants to see, this is a basic equation that uh, one could see from the properties of random walk. This, by the way, refers to three-dimension random walk. But interestingly, if you're just interested, say, in two-dimension, does anyone know how this equation would change? Somebody, somebody from the physics background, chemistry background. So the only effect would be not on the square root and not on the d or not on the tau. It would only change from 6 to 4 in terms of the pre-factor here. And if I'm only doing random walk in one dimension, which sounds very, very different from three dimensions, it would only change from 6 to 2. Okay, so it's only a pre-factor here. Interesting. So from this, I could easily infer that what would be the time. So I just need to inverse here. So I'll take the square of this. I would have r square. So I have r square divided by 6d. OK, this would give me the time that I'm interested in as a function of the distance that I want to pass through. OK, now let's plug in some numbers. So let's start with our, so we wanted to know about the bacteria. So in a bacteria, what would be the relevant R? So R would be on the order of one micrometer. And now I need to know what is my D. So diffusion coefficients, anyone who tried uh, during the, the recess uh, and maybe went to some, uh, I don't know, something try to Google it, it could come in all sorts of different units, and that could be quite uh, confusing. We have the freedom to choose a unit that would be relevant for the length scales that we're working on. So because in cells we're working with microns, you can measure it in microns, and a diffusion coefficient for a protein is on the order of 10 micrometers squared per second. This is uh, looking at what happens, say, within the cytoplasm. So that already takes into account the comment that we had from Moshe before that was saying, yeah, it depends on the concentration of other things. Yes, but already we could use a characteristic value for what happens inside the cytoplasm for a protein, and that would be around 10. If you're a very small metabolite, it could be something like 100 micrometers squared per second. So now let's try to plug them together. So tau is equal to r squared divided by 6d. So r squared is roughly 1 micrometer squared divided by 6 times 10 micrometer squared per second. So 1 squared stays 1. 1 divided by 60. Micrometer squared, micrometer squared, seconds in the denominator, so it's 1 over 60 of a second. That is somewhere around 10 milliseconds. Yes. 
And you can see the usefulness because I chose this. So this could be 10 to the minus 7 centimeters squared per second, all sorts of things like that. But the usefulness of this makes a number is not only easy to remember, but then I also can do the, uh, the calculation pretty quickly on almost anything that's relevant to cell biology. Let's look at the relevant time scale for a mammalian cell. So anyone wants to guess directly from this? So we said this is 10 milliseconds. So what should be mammalian cell? OK, so how, how much bigger is the mammalian cells? OK, so now this could be you, what I, th I see different people think about it in different ways, which is excellent, not because I like diversity and all that, but because it shows that there's something to, that we might be learning from that, at least some of us. So let's do the calculation and see what it tells us. So this was tau for bacteria. Now I want to do the tau for the mammalian cell. What would be the length scale? So I'm thinking here about a cell, and you know, we were talking about the HeLa cell, right? So for a HeLa cell, uh, usually it's a bit more than 10 uh, micrometers because it's actually it's an adherent cell, like what we study. So you, it starts from one place, it's around, say, R would be on the order of 20, mil, 20 micrometers that one has to go through. This was one, at one, this is 20. So I'm plugging this in, so again, it's R squared divided by 6D. And notice this uh, diffusion coefficient, because it's a property of the matter of, say, a protein and the cytoplasm, I, he doesn't care so much whether we're talking about a bacteria or mammalian cell. There could be some effect, but it's this relevant, even though it's very different cells, I would take exactly the same val val value. So R squared would be 20 micrometers squared divided by 6 times, again, 10 micrometer squared per second. So I have four hundred micrometer squared divided by sixty micrometer squared per second. So roughly ten seconds. So what happened here? Even though I had something that was only, say, 20 times bigger in terms of the distance that I had to go through, what happened to the time? Because of the factor of the squaring, because it goes as the square of the time, excuse me, because the, the distance goes as the square of the time, square root of the time, meaning that the time goes with the square of the distance, it means that the factor of 20 in distance goes into a factor of 400 times 400 fold in the relevant time scale. Okay? It came out to 1,000 just because we're looking at the closest order of magnitude. Yes? There is something which is uh, counterintuitive here because the, the, the motion is three dimensional, which means that if, uh, and not two dimensional, so I would, I would expect it to be slower by the factor of the, of the volume of three dimensional, not two dimensional. Okay, so something is not intuitive. You're saying I, you would have thought that because it's an issue of volume, maybe it should have go with a different exponent, and that's fine. Some of the things are not very intuitive. It's also I have to point out this is not saying about. It's not that I'm asking how long would it take reaching from one place on the membrane to a specific alternative place at a distance of r, but. It's, talking, it's not a specific place that it's reaching, but it's somewhere of a distance of R. So there's like a sphere of places where it could reach. And that might actually help or not help your intuition about what's happening here. So it's actually, there's, there's all sorts of fine points here, but this is why it's good to both think about it and to have some calculative tool to help us with. That's true. Which is probably what most people in mind. Right, so what, what was mentioned here is sort of like uh, the, the lingo of how uh, serious physicists would think about this process. It says something about the characteristic time until it reaches some distance and not the first 
first time that it would reach a given distance. Anyone who wants to know more about it could dig more deeply into it. It's a very rich and deep subject. So my challenge to you is the following, and I want you to try and do it in pairs. Given what we just said, I think uh, you're able to tell me how long does it take to diffuse across an axon that is one centimeter in length. Is it about one minute, one hour, one day, or one week, or one month? OK, so it's the, it's the same kind of question, but now, let's say it's not a HeLa cell, but it's an axon uh, of a neuron. And you have to diffuse uh, one centimeter. And so let's start with your intuition. Would you, who thinks it's one minute? A few, one hour? One? One day? Many? One week? A few? One month? The same one that thought that it's one week. OK, <laughs> that's fair. I can understand that. Um, OK, so I believe that uh, now we'll take five minutes in pairs, try to see if you can infer that together. So I hope you had uh, a good time trying it yourself. So. Um, we're talking about the axon, and we're talking about r, which is one centimeter. So that's roughly 10 to the 4 micrometers square. So why am I taking you from these nice, you know, intuitive units to this? It's because this is also the units in which I like to think. Uh, excuse me, yeah. This is because I like to think in units of micrometers whenever I want to do diffusion, because these are the value. These are the units in which I know something about the diffusion constant. OK? And we're interested in tau. So tau is r squared divided by 6 times the diffusion coefficient. So we have 10 to the 8 micrometer squared divided by 60, 6 times 10 micrometer squared per second. So we have roughly 10 to the 8 divided by, say, 10 to the 2. So I have 10 to the 6 seconds. 10 to the 6 seconds. Uh, you might remember the rule of thumb that tells us that in a day we have how many seconds? So that's, that's the usefulness of that. In a day you have about 10 to the 5 seconds. OK, how do we derive that if you want? So there's this neat thing called uh, 1 few 10 algebra. Anyone heard about this algebra? So this is not linear algebra. This is a simpler algebra, but very related to that. And that says, if I want to know the number of seconds in a day, what do I have to do? I have to start multiplying, right? I have to say, OK, I have 60 seconds per minute. I have to multiply it by 60 minutes per hour. I have to multiply it by about 24 not about, exactly, 24 hours <laughs> per day. OK, so how does the uh, 1 few 10 algebra uh, looks at that? It says everything is either 1, few, or 10. OK, so 6 is about 10. So we have 100. That's 10 to the 2 times another 10 to the 2. And now. Usually they say anything below 3 is, or anything that's, anything that's uh, close to, th to 3 is a few. So you actually round it, few is like, we have few times 10 
for this, which gives us all together 10 to the 2, 10 to the 4. So this is few times 10 to the 5. Few is like around 3. So there is a mistake here. It's not exactly 10 to the 6 in this calculation. But this kind of algebra is sometimes used if you want to do it really quickly. OK, that was an aside. What we wanted to say, if we have 10 to the 5 seconds per day, this gives us about 10 days. Which means that actually the same person that was uh, actually debating here between the... It's more than one month. So it's more like, yeah, so I didn't do it completely right, so this could turn into 20 days, so maybe it's from the one week to the one month. So if you were the one voting, you know, voting for both, then, then, then you are okay. Okay, so there's a good question here saying, should we use 2D or 3D in terms of thinking about the diffusion? Okay, so this is the kind of, you know, marvelous question that, you know, sometimes biologists would say, hey, you know, all your approach, you know, look, look, you know, what kind of a person are you that you're not even thinking about the biology behind it? And Exxon is so different if it's 2D or 3D. But, but let's look at what, or oh, 1D, right? You're saying, and he, even he thinks it's 2D or 3D, but actually it's even 1D. Okay, so let's say the following. First of all, one has to see, you know, what is the, what is the trade that we're in? This whole thing about 2D, 1D, or 3D would change between 6, 4, and 2. Okay? So as you can see in the kind of calculations that we do, it's actually not so important. Now about the geometry, it's true that if you look at the, at the aspect ratio of, of a neuron or an axon, it could look effectively like 1D. This is probably where the source of the question is. But even in that 1D, if you look at the width of that axon, how much would that be? What would be the diameter of an axon? A few microns. So for the molecule moving there, at least in, in those directions, there's still uh, orders of magnitude more than its own size. Meaning that if you actually want to do the calculation, it wouldn't be 1D. It would be some complicated combination that one could solve the problem of the boundary conditions because of that. In general, I would say it's all the same. So it's somewhere between 2, 4, and 6 if you solve it accurately. It would not change the order of magnitude. It might be relevant for some other things. Any other comments about our axon? Question? So, you just assume from this calculation that most um, things in the axon that have a destination would not go through diffusion? Okay, so, you, so if I understand correctly, you're saying, okay, if it takes, you know, a few weeks, what does that mean about the process of, 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 a diffu of, of diffusion? For example, if, you know, something, you know, I got into some accident, and my neuron unfortunately got severed, how long would it take until you know, it needs to be repaired? How long would it take the nucleus to even know about it or actually be able to transport something no, in order to bring there? Yes. So the answer is, so it really raises a problem of the fact that if you have something that needs to go a distance on the order of, you know, some, something like a centimeter, the rate of diffusion would be very limiting in the ability to transport matter in that way, and you need some other solution. For example, you can use molecular motors that walk on the kind of cytoskeletons we've been looking at in the second lecture, and these would be able to transport things faster. And actually, last year, one of the final assignments, one of the final projects, was about calculating it for different kind of neurons and different mechanisms. So that means also that, you know, just like you're pointing out, if, I was a ze if I'm a zebra and I want to transport something from my, I'm producing some protein in the nucleus, and I want it to get to, to, the, to the other side of the nucleus, say, from my head, actually, throughout my whole lifetime, it probably wouldn't reach this, this uh, protein that was produced when I was born as a zebra, it wouldn't reach the, as a? Giraffe. As a giraffe. Oops, I wanted a giraffe, sorry. Actually, it might actually be true for a zebra as well. <laughs> but I was aiming for a giraffe. Okay, not only do I don't know how, you know, 1D, 2D, 3D, actually you're even mixing, uh, mixing up zebras and giraffes. <laughs> Any more questions about that? Yeah. 
Okay, so same way as you have, when you have a cup of water, your salt will mix not because of diffusion, but you know, because of that movement. Okay, so the question is, uh, think for example of putting some ink inside water, right? You can calculate how long would it take the water, the, the molecules of ink, to disperse inside the water, right? What would be the time scale? How long would it take an ink molecule to reach, say, a distance of a centimeter inside inside the water by diffusion? Exactly the same thing, right? Because the equation of, of diffusion is the same equation. The distance we just said is the same distance. I want it to go one centimeter. And the diffusion coefficient, well, it depends. It might be, you know, what's exactly the properties of the ink and the water. It's not exactly a cytoplasm. So you know what? Maybe it's not 10 micrometers square per second. Maybe it's 100. But it wouldn't be so different. So again, it's supposed to take days. But you know that when you're putting ink, it doesn't take days until it disperses inside the water, it's almost immediately that you're starting to see some dispersal. Why? Because of exactly the question that was pointed out here. You're having other processes such as turbulence that would be flow of water that would actually take the ink and disperse it. So this is true for the ink and the water in my glass. Is it true or not in the cytoplasm? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know exactly the answer. How, how much is the turbulence relevant because we're talking about different length scales. So there's a, a whole issue called the Reynolds number that says how much there is or there isn't turbulence and how dominant is that or not. And maybe somebody would choose that for a final project. I have insight that somebody might be uh, telling us more about that. Good? Actually, so actually, so uh, two people. So actually we have good teasers for the two, for two final project presentations about how much is that important or not important. Uh, for cells. Okay, so that issue of, of the rates and diffusion uh, reminds me of a story. And this is actually a true story. Uh, just over a year ago, I was driving together with uh, a smart student here from the Weizmann Institute, Hila Gingold, and she told me about an idea that she had during the beginning of her PhD. And the idea was the following. So they were studying the process of translation. And so if I have an mRNA, and on the mRNA, as you know, there are different codons. So they come in, in triplicates. So let's say this is codon I, and then you have codon I plus 1, and then you have codon I plus 2. And you could have case, so of course, in order to do that, you have a tRNA coming and meeting the ribosome, giving the relevant amino acids, and it plugs in, and then you're creating the polypeptide, okay? And she was saying, okay, you could very often have, because we have 20 amino acids, but you have more tRNAs, you could have cases, for example, where you have the same amino acid being coded here and here. Let's say it's serine. Let's forget about I plus 1. Let's say you have serine being coded here, and two codons later, you also need serine happening again. Could happen, right? How every often would it happen? If everything was random, so serine would be here, say, 1 in 20, if everything was random. Of course, it's not. And then again, serine, that would be Again, 1 in 20, say 1 in 400, you'll have that combination if everything was random. And in general, but having this double would happen actually 1 in 20 cases, right? Because for whatever comes here, the chances you have the same thing again. So actually, it's not so rare, right? It would happen in quite, quite a percentage of the cases. So f and, and you know, because we have all the genome sequences, you said, hey, I can do a really elegant, quick and dirty project. I could just analyze genomes and say, this serine and this serine, it could be coded for by different tRNAs. You could have some tRNA, let's say UCC, coding for this serine, okay? You have uh, a triplicate the nucle of nucleotides. 
And then for this serine, I have several options. Let's say one of them would be exactly the same one, UCC. Or alternatively, I could have something completely different. AGU. Let's say AGU. <laughs> OK, I'm just taking two examples of, of uh, codons that could code for serine. Now, if this is the one coding, it means that the same tRNA that unloaded its cargo here could serve for putting this one again. Whereas if it's the different codon, it means you need a completely different tRNA. So her intuition was the following. If, if she were, if I was this, uh, this organism, there, if I need a serine here once again, maybe there's an advantage to using the same codon rather than the other codon because that means that after I download it, as, as we saw before, this issue of the time scale for doing translation could be quite limiting. So it would be better if I used the same codon as I had before. And by that, just after I downloaded my cargo, I could reach, I would be dispersed back again, but then I could recharge and then put it back again. Is the issue clear? So she went and started checking on that. And she found that, hey, actually there is this signature inside genomes that you do find that in many cases you have the same codon in higher concentration than the alternative codon. It's related to issues related to codon usage, but let's talk now just about the issue of its possible mechanism as improving the translation rate by the fact that you have basically a higher and elevated local concentration of that tRNA of the UCC tRNA by the fact that it was just released just very recently. So the local concentration of that tRNA is higher. And then if it, if it reloads again and is used again, you're getting a faster kinetics. Okay, so that was the idea. There's a question here. Okay, so there's a question here about the rate of loading and reloading. So we'll be talking about it in just a minute. So this was the idea. So she thought about that idea. She started to do some analysis, but then as maybe you already experienced, life in science, you have other things. She had other projects she was working on. So somehow that got sidetracked. And sometime later, what happened? Scooped. Somebody else published a cell paper on the mechanism of the fact that you can get an enhancement, a better kinetics, by the fact that you could have the same tRNA coding uh, and by that increasing the local concentration of tRNA. End of story. Okay, fast forward to our course. Let's analyze the relevant effect and time scales. So we have this codon and we have this codon and now we want to talk about time scales. So the question is, if I have a tRNA let's say it's the UCC tRNA, that was carrying serine, was plugging it in here, then being released. The ribosome was already moving to the next uh, stage. And then it would reload and then would be ready to put the same amino acid in position I plus two. The question is, what is the difference in time, the characteristic time between uh, these two things happening because right after it's being so it was put in then it's released after it finishes that Now there's something else that needs to happen and then it needs to plug in again Okay in that time the tRNA can diffuse around So what is the free time between the first loading and the the, the first codon and the codon separated bait? How much is that uh, time difference roughly? You remember we were talking about the rate of translation. Anyone remembers what was the rate of translation? About 20 amino acids per second. Okay, so what would be a relevant time scale for the difference? About one tenth of a second, right? So we could start disputing whether it's 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds, but it's on the order of, let's say one millisecond. Uh, 100 milliseconds. Of course, it depends exactly on the mechanism of when does it release and when does it load again. But 
if it, there's like cycles here. So if it just finished at the end of the cycle, then there's a cycle which takes about 100 milliseconds, and then it needs to reload again. OK, so the question is now, if we know that time scale, this tRNA is supposed to increase. It has to have a higher local concentration. So how much does it diffuse in order to understand at which volume does it increase the local concentration? So what would be the distance that it diffuses in this delta t? So I would say that each of you is able to probably do that after this class, because the size of a tRNA is not very different from the size of a protein. And the diffusion coefficient is therefore kind of similar. So it means that if I know that r is equal to the square root of 6 times d times tau. This is just the same equation that we used all the time, just reversed. I need to plug in here 6 times 10 micrometers squared per second times 0.1 second. This gives me 10 times 0 0.1 is 1, square root of 6, so that's about 2 seconds fall with seconds, 2 micrometers. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying that the tRNA, after it was released by the ribosome, until it would be used again, it would diffuse in that 0.1 second about 2 micrometers in this 0.1 second. So in that, so this is the kind of distance or volume, if you like, in which you're elevating the local concentration of the tRNA. But now we need to ask how much of an effect is that? So we've been adding another tRNA, the specific tRNA that we need, in this volume, in this size of two microns, which means that the volume <coughs> is about what? It's about two micrometer cubed, so we have here about 10 micrometer cubed of volume in which we've added another tRNA. In order to know whether that's a lot or just a little bit, we need to refer to how many tRNAs are there already of that specific kind. So a characteristic concentration for tRNAs Anyone knows what would that be? What would be the characteristic concentration of a tRNA, let's say, in a yeast cell or a bacterial cell or mammalian cell? So a concentration would be roughly on the order of 10 micromolar for tRNAs, for a specific tRNA. Let's say we are interested in the UCC tRNA. So the question for you guys is how many would it be in this 10 micrometer cubed? How many? Rewind class number three, we had the rule of thumb, right? One molecule in one micrometer cubed is one nanomolar. So I hear 10,000, right? Because if we're talking about 10 micromolar, that's four orders of magnitude. So I have 10,000, but that's in the volume of one micrometer cubed. We're talking about 10 micrometer cubed, so 100,000. So I have about 100,000 tRNAs of UCC inside this volume that I've diffused into. And now it's much better. It's 1,000 plus 1. OK, this is the effect that comes from the fact that I've just released the tRNA there, and I have a higher local concentration. By how much? By this amount. End of story once again. <laughs> so the effect that we're seeing here is probably related to all sorts of things that are happening inside the cell, but it's not about a tRNA being released and then being reused as the intuition of Hila was originally and as is roughly explained in the paper. Right? It's something that actually makes, it could make a lot of sense when you think about it, 
in theory or in the way we think about in, in normal life that we you know we do something and then we're available to do it once again, but that does not mean that that's how it is for the cells in the microscopic world. I would say that, you know, so of course I went back to read the paper, you know, word by word, and then somewhere, so they talk, actually it's, it's a, similar to what I've just told you, but then at the end of the discussion they say there could also be a mechanism in which the tRNA that is being released is actually not diffusing, but maybe it's sort of like it could attach to the ribosome, and the ribosome have all sorts of tRNAs attached to it, and then it could reload, and then by the fact that it stays in proximity, so now not diffusing for that 0.1 second, but actually it's actually they're all bound to it, all sorts of tRNAs, and then they could come back, load, reload, and, but stay bound to it, so it's a different concept of how a ribosome could look like. Maybe that's also at play. So that maybe is the explanation to why actually there is a signal of why is it indeed more common if you look at the genomes to see this, but actually that has not been proven. So I would say the puzzle is still out there. Okay, so this was the story that I wanted to share with you and how it relates to rates. And in ending, um, a few things. Before I give you the teaser for next class, I just want to point out again in relation to rates that you have to uh, make a final project of five minutes. You have to send us the... Uh, the project by the time uh, that you give the exercise for, which I think is actually today. So those who did not send us yet the final, your suggestion for a final project, do it today, please. If you're still debating, that's also fine. You can send us one option and, you know, and, or several options, and you want to, us to comment on that, that's completely fine. If when working on it, you find that you want to change that, that's also fair. Just let us know. As you'll see in the guidelines, you need to prepare for it, and you have to prepare for it at least a week in advance with the person that you're working on. So it's good that you start preparing it for it now and you'll be ready forever. Anything that I forgot? There's the exercise. Uh... Right, there's also an exercise. That's the final exercise and after that you only need to do the final project. The exercise this week, uh, we'll be talking about rates and how uh, ribosome and its rate could uh, affect the growth rates and some other interesting stuff that I hope you'll find uh, useful. And in ending, we'll be looking uh, next week at information. And for thinking about information, we thought we're thinking mostly about genomes. So if we'll be comparing genomes and genes. of Homo sapiens and E. coli, the two organisms that are closest to us. So if I'm talking about the genome size, is uh, Homo sapiens versus E. coli, is it 500 fold, excuse me, 5,000 fold bigger 500 fold bigger, 50 fold bigger, or 5 fold bigger. And in terms of gene number, is it 5,000 five fold, 500 fold, 50 fold, or 5 fold? Is the question clear? So Homo sapiens, you versus E. coli in your gut or in your lab, is the genome size 5,000 times bigger? Few, 500 times bigger? Few more, most, 50 times bigger? A few, five times bigger? Nobody. Gene number, 5,000 times more genes? Nobody, 500 times more genes, one, 50 times more genes, most, five times more genes, the other most. Okay, we'll be uh, learning more about this next week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>